crimes from the east today i have a very special episode and i know i always say every single episode is special but today it is truly special because today i will be chatting with renowned indian astrobiologist pushkar vaidya he is the head scientist at the indian astrobiology research foundation in mumbai and why am i talking to pushkar today because he's an astrobiologist astrobiology only means one thing in my eyes and you can tell me if i'm wrong pushkar but that means life in outer space right like life off of earth i love talking about stuff like that so hello and welcome pushkar um welcome welcome and tell us all about astrobiology yes thank you pia and thanks for uh, having me over yes so we'll discuss a few things which are from this world and from outside right <laughs> so uh, well astrobiology if you like you know well there's a standard definition for it you know that you're looking for the evolution and origin and distribution of life across the universe and then mm-hmm. that's the key you know because you cannot be sure that everything started back here or that everything happens you know only here and that's the whole uh, the the whole let's say the seduction of astrobiology yeah so there is some alien connection right absolutely <laughs> Okay, excellent. So I heard that you spent your early life in Sri Lanka. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Oh yes, that's true. You know, so my my father actually ended up there. He he was he is into textiles, and uh, you know, so I sort of tagged along. And uh, I had written a book by then. You know, I was sixteen, but I wrote in a book. It was called "In Search of Aliens." Since I was a kid, or not even before my teenage years, actually, you know, I was obsessed with looking for life outside Earth. and there was a reason for that and that reason still continues to this day that um, i wanted to find out that why do we exist right i i would ask people that why do we exist and i never got a very satisfactory answer and then let's say when you speak to people who seem to know that answer and they would give me that answer but their answer wouldn't match with the other guys who seem to know you know know the answer and i was like well these guys seem to be not knowing anything and maybe we should check with someone who is not from this planet you know so so that was the that was the reason you know i wanted to look for aliens and then i and then i wrote this in search of aliens and i found myself in sri lanka and i was like well like any good book it should have a uh, it should have a forward from someone famous and i had read a few books from arthur c clarke and arthur c clarke used to uh, stay in sri lanka and and back then i did not know that he's an extraordinary man all that i knew was he has written a lot of books and you know not a bad mm-hmm. guy to get the forward from I still remember that that meeting pretty vividly you know he would call me over and there goes a thesis clerk you know instead of trying to teach me or tell me anything he, he sort of points towards a book i think over some print out it had this traditions on europa and he asked what are your thoughts about these things and I was like wow <laughs> you know that is how it was so europe of course uh, you know being the the moon of one of the moons of jupiter so yeah and i think we spoke a bit about ufo's too So would you say that a meeting with Arthur C Clarke kind of cemented your journey and turned your interest or obsession or just curiosity about this field into your career? No, absolutely. Yeah. So the, so of course, you know, he was my mentor. We we kept in touch, you know, till the time he passed away in the in, in the 2000s and he was a very kind and generous man. and uh, yes i i think what it did was you know it it kept me from within the frameworks of the scientific method you know mm-hmm. so i could have ended up as a molder you know but i ended up as a cross between a molder and scully that was going to be a question i was going to ask you are a molder or a scully and i'm glad you've answered that okay yeah so that was the main main advantage of 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 meeting clark in fact i mean one of the 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 the, the thing was that you know he had this huge book on his on his desk mm-hmm. right i think it was a 1000 page or something and i cannot recollect the name for god's sake but the thing was that i should remember he telling me that all of this cannot be hysteria mm. speaking in the context of ufo sightings and his massive book on his desk and that's the question all of that cannot be hysteria can it be <laughs> so apparently annually there are at least 80000 sightings reported in the world all across the globe and that's what i keep thinking fine maybe 79000 of them are misunderstandings some are lies some are hoaxes but it maybe one's got to be real one's got to be a real sighting the probability can't be zero that all 80000 reports are false No, absolutely, or, or at least all the eighty thousand cannot be weather balloons and planet Venus. Yes, yes, Project Blue Book. Like, what were your favorite 
alien or UFO or space icons in popular culture growing up? Like which movies or shows influenced your thoughts and I'd say your career so far? No, I think I'm 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 uh, outright the from the you know from the X Files generation. Yes, me too, me too. There's nothing more required, you know, if you are from that generation. The depth of X Files, and then the, the chemistry of the characters, and then and I think the the very honestly how they went about it, it was so genuine and authentic. I think a lot of us wanted to be Scully and Mulders back then, you know. So I tried my best to be across as much as possible. <laughs> Yeah, um, same here. Um, I too grew up watching X Files because it had just come out in India at that time, I believe, and it was unlike anything else that was on TV, and it really did shape a lot of, you know, what interests me so far in life. And I don't know about you, but I was a total X Files junkie. Like my Windows theme was X Files. You know, all my Winamp skins were X Files. The when I turned my computer on, I would hear the X Files theme come on, and I had pictures of Mulder and Scully all over. So yeah, I was totally into it. What about you? Oh well, I did not have a PC, so I, I think I was spared all that. <laughs> <laughs> but then I did have my share of posters. And I think one of the one of the great things it it did was you know so I was this kid from India you know who has gone to Sri Lanka in in Colombo, mm. and back then you know there were not too many you know Indian kids in the in the international schools especially. Mm. The moment you know you have to well get going with the other kids and all that and they are from all different nationalities. And what actually saved my day was the fact that I was the best at let's say interpreting what the the X Files was the previous night. And they are oh. all waiting to catch up with me the next one, the next morning. <laughs> and I could break the ice, and you know, and we we made some lifelong friendships. So I think X Files was just a lot more than just a show for me. Let's talk about some famous cases. I'm sure you've heard about Roswell. So in 1947, in New Mexico, a rancher he reported debris in his fields. The army takes over, and they first reported that yes, there was a some kind of weird flying saucer that had been recovered. But then they totally turned their narrative and they said that it's a weather balloon. Uh, of course, conspiracy theorists since then have insisted that it was an otherworldly craft and it was recovered, not only craft, but also possibly a biological material or an entity was recovered at that site. And I believe he was an army investigator called Jesse Marcel. He claimed Marcel, to the end right. that it was true that there was a craft that was recovered. I'm sure you've heard of Roswell. Oh yes, and I, I think that astrobiology 101, you know, in in the UFO <laughs> module category, you know, that you you start with start with Roswell. That's how you know I think the whole idea of cover ups I think really got going mm. rather than the saucers, <laughs> you know, because I think the UFO phenomenon has continued and continued along with that is this template. And and this is a very dangerous template, you know, because uh, to have a different opinion does not make you a conspiracy theorist. Mm. And that is a very important thing because so much disrespect has crept into this subject, you know, and it, it is time to get, get rid of that, you know, because let's say I, I say something else, you know, that doesn't make me a conspiracy theorist. That's how science is done, actually. We need to put the respect back into uh, into ufology. Something like like J. Allen Hynek would go by saying that uh, mockery is not a part of the of the scientific method, and it should not be taught that it is, you know. So it's something like that. Ironically, he himself was responsible for a lot of the mockery that was published at that time uh, because of Project Blue Book. But I guess he was recruited by the government and intelligent agencies at that time to cover it up for the better good or you know, to kind of right. spare humanity the throes of having to deal with this. Um, there's a very interesting book on this incident called The Day After Roswell. If you read it, it'll blow your mind. And after some, some time, you're just wondering, is this fiction or what? Because it's unbelievable, the confidence and the certainty with which the author talks about the Roswell crash retrieval and the entity retrieval and how right. so many of our mo modern inventions are based off of reverse engineering the tech that was recovered at Roswell. No, that's true because see, there's this little history about Roswell, you know, that some of these things which they found, there are these certain strange looking symbol and, you know, there was this inscription on the on the stuff uh, found at the ranch. And then there is a there is a follow up story, you know, that some of these things, including, let's say, at least one or two uh, aliens which were injured but let's say alive 
they, they are the ones who are supposedly who ended up at Area 51 and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Then of like 30, 40 years, then you have this Bob Lazar and he's trying to say, well, he found, a, he, he saw a few discs at, uh, at Area 51. So there is a link. In fact, there was this movie, uh, Alien Autopsy. You know, it, I think it has been debunked if I remember, but it was a fantastic trigger back then. It was Alien Autopsy, fact or fiction. And, and, and it claimed to be an autopsy of an aliens found in, uh, you know, in the Roswell crash. You know, so, so Roswell, of course, is, is interesting. Yes. So just to prove to you how much of a UFO nerd I am, um, I got the internet around 1997, 98. And so when everybody else, all the teenagers in the world were probably looking for girlfriends or boyfriends online, I was looking for aliens and UFOs. And, <laughs> and that's what I came across. So I saw the alien autopsy video back. Oh, you did. Right. I was convinced it was real. I was like, oh, my God, look, it's an alien. It's great. It's true. It's real. They say it's been debunked, but it was a recreation of an actual autopsy of which they do have. They don't have a full movie, but they have frames of 8mm or something of that sort. So oh. I don't know. We don't know. Uh, I mean, anything can be debunked, you know, with someone who's good at convincing people otherwise. But that doesn't right. mean that it wasn't true. So we... I guess we'll never know. So the other really major incident that I love to read about is the Phoenix Lights. Um, right. So residents in, I, I believe, 1995 or could be 97. I'm so sorry. but 97, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Residents in Phoenix, Arizona saw a brilliant set of illuminations or lights in a triangular formation gliding silently and slowly over the skies of that region for several hours. And it was seen by thousands of people but never properly explained. There are several documentaries on this incident. Well, there's one called The Phoenix Lights by James Fox. Right. There's another one called I Know What I Saw. And then the latest one, which I highly recommend anyone even remotely interested in this uh, to watch, is The Phenomenon. Oh, all right. Also by James Fox. Excellent, excellent documentaries. Again, what the government said was that these were just flares that, that right. the air force was dropping at that time for some kind of drill and yes there was a flare drop which occurred a couple hours later which i believe could have just been a cover-up so that it could be used as an explanation for what other people were seeing at that time so yes cover-ups every single incident just has cover-ups so frustrating have you heard about the phoenix lights yeah, very much. So, in fact, I, I, I do these workshops for the public called as the Life in Space workshops. Mm -hmm. Towards the end, you know, we look at the possibilities of aliens actually being here. And one of the cases, you know, which are, you know, which say there's enough high confidence, you know, to cite is the Phoenix Lights. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, of course, primarily meeting the criteria of more than one person witnessing what has happened. So this so-called credibility issue, you know, is taken out of the window, you know, so people are not mad. Well, you have seen what I have seen. So, th so that's like one big advantage of that case. The other part which comes along with Phoenix Lights, there are actually two sightings. You know, yes. one was this flare-like stuff and the other was this triangle-like thing, you know, which was going around and off which we don't seem to have, you know, any footage per se. Even, even later, the governor sort of comes around and says, you know, that, uh, well, this is out of this world. And, you know, he couldn't say it back then. And I think he, he, he did this press conference where he actually mocked the whole thing, you know, that this is aliens. He brings this alien in the press conference how the politics works, that he comes around um, years later and say, well, you know, I think that was aliens. Right. So it is as good as a case it goes. See, Pia, you and I don't go to a Pentagon or a CIA to ask that, does the sun exist? <laughs> yeah. Right. So if you see it, it exists. It's already a fact. So how the hell do you, you are going to say that? Well, it, it is not a fact. That governor was Fife Symington. I just looked him up. Right. <laughs> That's correct. That's correct. Yes. So it's, it's a fantastic thing to remember that how actual science is being hijacked by a narrative, you know, which is somehow, let's say, led by intelligence agencies. It makes no sense. Yeah. And the whole premise that the public can handle it. I don't want to quote Jack, but you can handle the truth. Yes, we can handle the truth. We can. Why do they believe that we'll just go crazy if we think there are aliens are in this world and that society would cease to function normally? Why do you think that's the the overarching reasoning for cover-ups? I think it is it is absolutely stupidity, you know, and that's that's the reason we are running this little survey. 
we are not taking this head on you know so just because i tell you that uh, well i'm a scientist and you are not i'm supposed somehow i'm supposed to know more than you it does not work that way because in the scientific method there is something uh, you know which is called as observation so you either you state a question or you do an observation then you do some background research on that topic then you you know have certain idea that what might be causing this you know so you have an hypothesis then you do something to test it with experiment you get some results and you report the conclusion to you know whoever it is yeah. now you tell me pia you know if you do this does that does that not make you a scientist as well yeah. you and i are on the same plane and that is the greatness of science you know whether it is you einstein hawking or me we are all on the same level mm-hmm. as long as we are following the scientific method mm. it is very very you know very very critical for the ufo research to develop properly that people do not give into the tags which are assigned to them by by scientists you know by calling you conspiracy theorist or a pseudo scientist or a nut job for that matter yes well it doesn't doesn't matter because if you follow the scientific method that's all science is about yes i agree and i'm sure my mom also agrees because my interest was fueled further by my mom's interest in the field so she even today like she'll be researching all these kind of um, you can call them paranormal or unorthodox subjects all over the world and so she she would always made fun of in my family like kooky you know she's kooky she's she's always learned you know talking about aliens and waiting for aliens to come and stuff so i get it i get it i mean sure it's casual but it's still thrown into ridicule if you're interested in it or if you believe in it uh, and how is that different from believing in a god you've never seen right you, no that is not, the thing you're you know. not ridiculed for be having faith you're praised for it but now if you have faith in something else that you haven't probably seen you're made a fool of which is so hypocritical right no it it definitely is and the thing is that we shouldn't be you know people in general shouldn't be buying into that bullshit that's the whole point there yeah. you know because the survey you know, which i was trying to refer to and i think i almost forgot about it mm-hmm. was the question which you raised that you know uh, i mean there is going to be social disorder civil strife mm-hmm. people going hysterical yeah. having a go at each other just because you dis- aliens exist try india we don't give a damn about it you know so what has happened is this has become a very uh, culturally monotonous uh, you know narrative mm. we really don't care you know because it will be like okay of course they are also created by the the ultimate reality mm. let them come around not an issue there is no problem i can guarantee you <laughs> you know there is no problem <laughs> and and we are not we are not less number of people we are quite a population of this world you know greater than the entire united states put together for that matter so so as the asian nations get involved as we come from a different cultural background the narrative will benefit you know because it has become monotonous it has become stagnant so i am from from india you know we are rooted in india and and no we are not we are least concerned and and if you are going to throw you know that you don't know what you are dealing with then you have no idea you know what our mythology makes us deal with in the first place <laughs> you know so it's the yes, aliens we need read, to watch out have you read our mythology like hello ramayana mahabharata we are used to all these kind of uh, paranormal or anthropomorphic ah, i can't say it humanoid and you know hybrid species and we're used to all that that's not new to us we've seen all of it in our mythology we're used to it we're conditioned to accept the strange and the crazy like yes you're right indians wouldn't really be yes and, and we are a significant part of the world's population and so are the chinese and so are the other asian races and it adds to it let's say don't you and do you have a, a microscope strong enough for let's say so much education in microbiology or or virology to tell that uh, the sars cov 2 virus exists don't we at the end order they put faith into because some institution said so that we all agree that there is something called as covid-19 mm. just because at the end of the day you have to put some faith somewhere yes you know and and that is you know even if you are doing science it is not that the faith is gone out of it because alternatively each one should be having a microscope and check for ourselves where is covid-19 yes but we do trust and we do not wait for a pentagon to declare covid-19 you know the cdc who might come and declare so where is the science where are the scientists in the ufos why the hell a pentagon is involved we don't need the military intelligence or the defense 
framework to be responsible for this. And I believe Mulder actually says this in an episode. The government doesn't have a monopoly on this phenomenon. And that is so true. Like, why do we look at the Pentagon to be responsible for information dissemination or to be the ultimate authority on this? They have no right. They have no jurisdiction over this. It's global. It belongs to you, me, everyone else in the world. We are earthlings from this planet. And if there is an alien civilization that wants to make contact, we're all equal on that plane. The Pentagon or any other defense agency doesn't have monopoly over it. So, yeah. And I love that you brought up how we as Indians or, you know, Desis have a different perspective on this because I've wondered about that often. When you hear about all of these news, you know, journalists and authors and, you know, other scientists talk about this phenomenon in the recent past, the past few months after disclosure that occurred in June in 2020, right? The Pentagon released that report stating there were 144 incidents or so that we can't explain the origins of. It was some kind of unmanned craft uh, or manned craft that we don't know the origins of and all of a sudden we see all these scientists and authors and journalists talk about it but it's all coming from the major western countries right all american perspective british perspective some australian perspective where's the desi voice in this where is the desi voice in this and that's why i wanted to talk to you pushkar because we need to hear different perspectives we have different thoughts right we approach it from a different angle than say someone from a Western upbringing and we need to join in on the conversation. So I'm very glad to be talking to you about this today, Pushkar. And I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> no, absolutely, Pia. And you know, the, the fact that, you know, we are talking about uh, Western scientists and stuff like that and why a Pentagon, you know, requires to, uh, let's say, try to authenticate, stamp a phenomenon which is there happening in nature. At the, at the end of the day, it's, it's happening in nature. And what follows is that if I'm going to mock you, and I see this a lot, in, especially in, 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 the, in the Western discourse. I mean, let's say, you know, I, I've been on Reddit, uh, you know, uh, I, I joined Reddit recently, but I've been reading it, you know, on and off. They are making, you know, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful arguments they make, the, the, the exchange, you know, and so on and so forth. The whole discourse by Western science is very disrespectful towards this community of people. Mm. And... At least after 20, you know, in June 2021, I did not hear anyone coming and, you know, giving an apology for all the, you know, trash which was thrown at people who are keeping the subject alive. Interestingly, I did not even see the very people protesting that at least now you owe us an apology. It is so much of mockery. And, and therefore, I would, uh, you know, some of these guys on Reddit, for instance, I can tell you your comments are sometimes better than the research papers out there. <laughs> Yes. And yeah, thank you to everyone that has, you know, kept the subject alive and well and had discussions and, you know, joined in on forums for all these decades, despite the ridicule. And I'm, I'm so glad that we have anonymous forums like Reddit, where, you know, you don't have to have your name or your credentials published, and you can still talk about it without fear and without the fear of ridicule. However, yes, as you say, let's change that. Let's Let's destigmatize it and make it normal. And that's what I said in my UFO episode. Let's make UFOs normal. Let's make it mainstream. Can we have a hashtag like aliens lives matter? You know, and, and, <laughs> and you know, and, and get the scientists to tweet about it because it was the scientific community, you know, which was doing the disservice. Can yeah. we have a day maybe on the Roswell <laughs> Day or the World UFO Day, you know, where they actually tweet aliens lives matter because they do. So um, I don't know if you heard my UFO episode, but I talk about some of the sightings in the South Asian subcontinent. Most of the cases that I found online were from the 1950s. And that's, I think, because of Project Blue Book and NICAP, which is, an, again, an American civilian organization that recorded UFO sightings all around the world. They looked into them, and which is why we have record of those sightings. After that, of course, nothing. I don't see anything reported in India till maybe the last decade. Right. Is there any reporting agency in India or South Asia, for that matter, where people can go report? Is there a MUFON? Is there anything? 
Right. We get a lot of these sightings. You know, we get sometimes phone calls and emails, you know, and these sort of things that happen. We generally just direct them to go to move on. Yeah. Now, uh, back in uh, June, July 2021, this year, we have set up a center of excellence for UFO uh, studies. It's called the ICU, a center of excellence for UFOs. The first initiative under that center has been to run this uh, survey, you know, and, and we are insisting that we want it to be truly global, that we should have participants from every country you know, on, the, on this planet. Mm -hmm. And that survey is to address the question which you earlier raised with respect to, uh, you know, what happens if you make contact, yeah. you know, are we expecting yeah. civil strife and so on. So that's the first thing which we are taking into account. The second one is, you know, we want to bring up a mechanism by which the sightings can be reported in India. Hmm. And that's why, you know, we are possibly going to raise some funds and stuff like that because we have sightings in India. I mean, in fact, the Indo-Tibetan police had been reporting them in the early 2010s right to the Prime Minister of India. And I think one of the UFOs somehow ended up at the, at the, at the residence of the current Prime Minister. You know, yes, so these sightings exist, you know, but then they are, you know, mostly restricted to media reports, you know, but there's no proper documentation. And I'm sure, you know, we will have thousands of them, you know, if we are able to get them sorted. Yes. So, so we will be having a mechanism in place. I'm not aware of one which is existing right now. Nothing at least on a large scale for sure. What takes a sighting from maybe I saw something to I saw something to it being studied and regarded as a serious sighting is reporting. So that's very important. And thank you for having that in your plans, Pushkar. Absolutely. Let's jump into it, right into it. So I looked up a couple of terms that you know, I've been listening about and reading about for the last few years. And one of the main questions that all humans ask at some point, and I think you mentioned it early on, was why do we exist? Why are we here? Where did we come from? Who made us? What made us? And so the beginning blocks of life on this planet, from what I read, there is something called the primordial soup, which is considered as, you know, the birthplace of life on Earth. Charles Darwin theorized evolution. And then the scientist Alexander Oparin hypothesized that the ultimate first single-celled organism was a result of an abiotic genesis in that primordial soup. So you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, that's what you you read in textbooks. That's what you read. Mm. I'm talking, of course, when the Earth started back then. You know, we're talking of around maybe four billion years and somewhere around that. And within a few hundreds of million years, you know, you created the first cell. Now, it's very well known in cell biology, you know, that to, the whole problem here is to create the first cell. It's a huge problem. You know, I can sort of turn around and ask, then, if it was that simple, then why the hell are we not able to replicate it? What was so special about that event? So we, we really don't know. The fact is, you know, we, we have no idea what is life. Forget about a cell for that matter. But then the whole intention here is to make it feel like or sound like as if we know. Now, that is the other danger, you know, which uh, has crept into science. Science is being spoken of in a lot of tone of finality, as if we know. So that tonality is, is that way. Now, that is absolutely terrible. We have no idea what is life. Forget about it coming from us. Okay, you can say so because you, you don't know. It's like saying you, you don't have a telescope, let's say, you know, which looks beyond the moon. And you are like, well, that's all I have. So we must have come from the moon or something like that. Yeah. You know, so, so we have no uh, scientific evidence to suggest how that transition happened. So it's nothing but an hypothesis. So I read about something called the Miller-Urey experiments where they supposedly or successfully were able to create uh, amino acids under, you know, similar conditions that Earth may have had billions of years ago. That is true, but that is nothing but chemistry mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And I think there are certain suggestions that, you know, there was long ago when some of these clay started to, let's say, learn what is called as self-replication. So the inanimate matter somehow learned how to self-replicate somehow learn a little bit of self-organization. Now, self-organization is, is one of the very core cool things about the entire cosmos, for that matter. But then, if you go down that line, then you're literally talking about the origins of life. You have to go right back to the Big Bang. And you cannot start talking about it, you know, how it came on Earth. 
And so it's, it's, a, it's again, it's a question of how you look at it. So if you look at it from the Eastern perspective, you know, let's say from India, I know we, we consider life to be a cosmic phenomenon by default. Yes. Interconnectedness of life. Mm-hmm. Not looked at up, you know, in any sort of isolation that it's on Earth. In fact, there are so many, you know, you know, this thing where the gods are literally living right now on different parts of the universe, yes. or if you like, on different planes and dimensions. You know, so we are not so so close to it. But this whole thing of the single cell sort of thing, yes, you know, it is an hypothesis, you know, which is good to sort of build up. But it's nothing more than that. Life might have come from outside, from what we call as panspermia. On that note, so are you saying that there is a chance that we are transplants from another solar system or planet? I know it's an interesting thought and also, a, well, it's a conspiracy theory. I don't want to call it that, but unfortunately, <laughs> that's what we're calling it, that we were seeded on Earth by some kind of superior beings, human-like ETs for I don't know what purpose. The movie Prometheus has a fantastic visualization of that theory. What do you think? It may well be the case. How do you say it is not? The whole question is that, you know, that the only problem is, you know, if you try to uh, put it in the scientific method, and that's all, to be honest with you, you know, you are making an observation, you're looking at something live, okay? You, you, you are sort of doing some background research. So your hypothesis is it, maybe it was just put down here, what we, you know, not directed panspermia, if you like, or the zoo hypothesis, so to say, you know, that you're actually put down here. So be it. Simple definition of science, the way I see it is that that what cannot be tested is not science. Right now, the question is, can we test it? The answer is, yes, it can be tested. When scientists are looking for signs of life outside of our solar system or our galaxy or whatever, instead of looking up at the sky, if you believe in the panspermia or fine maybe we were planted here by beings that theory maybe looking into our dna for evidence of that might also be another way of searching for extraterrestrial life right because what if we did come from somewhere else are there hidden codes inside of our dna are there unexplained bits i know like our genome was sequenced and everything but i think there's still a lot of gray area about what certain sequences in our dna are meant for what do they hold what are they coded for we still don't know i believe right no absolutely and you know i think there is a there's a mainstream science to it something another thing you know which we intend to uh, do direct research in for that matter called as genetic seti or genomic seti so a search for extraterrestrial intelligence which actually looks into our, our DNA. Maybe there are certain, let's say, uh, you know, certain messages inside it. That's one possibility. Because you see, if you want to send information across the cosmos, so one of the best ways to send a lot of information, which can be replicated rather than sending one message in a bottle, is, is actually put them into a DNA and you know, send them along. You know, and, and we have figured out life is pretty tough as it goes in Jurassic Park, life finds a way. So maybe it will find find a way and uh, the, the possibility of there being a lot more to be read into the genetic material is absolutely true, you know, and, and that's a very legitimate way of uh, doing science because we are making, a, again, coming back to the scientific method, we are making a prediction mm. that we should be looking for something, 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 you know, if you are able to make that prediction, I'm saying, you know, then you are doing, we are doing good science. Yeah, I'm excited. Like if if someone tomorrow comes up and tells me, we have evidence that there's some code in our DNA that's alien in nature. Just imagine all those aliens we've been looking for all these years is inside of us. We are the aliens. (laughs) (laughs) That's true, very much. So you mentioned panspermia and I wanted to discuss that a little bit. Panspermia is the hypothesis hypothesis that life exists throughout the universe distributed by space dust meteorites asteroids and other you know celestial bodies as well as by spacecraft carrying unintended contamination or by microorganisms wikipedia says and i'm mad about this but wikipedia says that panspermia is a fringe theory with little support from mainstream scientists Critics argue that it does not answer the question of the origin of life, but merely places that responsibility on another celestial body. It is also criticized because it was thought that it could not be tested experimentally. What are your thoughts on that, Pushkar? 
Oh, well, so firstly, you know, the panspermia never claimed that it is a, it's an hypothesis about, uh, you know, explaining the origin of life because by its very definition, it's not. Yes. You know, it, it is suggesting that life travels from planet to planet, stars to stars, and maybe galaxies to galaxies. Now, the thing is that we thought life was very fragile, you know, and, and it's a very <laughs> just stupid sort of uh, uh, view to have. In, in a modern time now, you know, if you look back, it feels very stupid you know, that you could, you could think that you could just boil some water and you can kill everything in that water. It doesn't work that way. So I think what we have concluded is that human life is very fragile. And I think our ego makes us believe that we are the ultimate, like the apex predator. We are the, on top of the food chain and we are what matter. Maybe ultimately we find out we really don't matter at all. We're just like at the bottom of the rung when it comes to being the ambassador of life in our solar system, right? From a species perspective, we are just about a couple of million years, you know, and I think we are, we are just trying to be too nosy about how good we are, <laughs> you know, so I, I, I don't think, you know, we are, there's too much hubris, too much hubris. Yes, I mean, yes. hubris itself is bad and may I add too much to it, you know, you understand we are in serious trouble and, and we really don't know and life can very much have independent origins in different places because in nature, nothing happened once. Now it depends upon how much you want to expand the definition of nature. Like, do you include a Mars and, and Moon and Venus into nature? It's only about your national park, you know. But uh, if you expand as, as a cosmos as one, which physics already does, because it says that, you know, let's say the energy has to stay constant, right? Hmm. Basically, you know, we should be looking at the entire cosmos for the origin of life by that very definition. And it makes no sense whatsoever, you know, to suggest that life cannot travel. We have found that when microbes jump from, let's say, a planet to planet or something like that, it is close to impossible for them to survive, hence the apprehension. But that's exactly where the scientific method comes in. So let it be an hypothesis which can be, let's say, explored. Hmm. All that you require to do is to, uh, like, you know, let's say we are going to go to Moon and Mars quite a few times in the coming couple of decades. Well, you know, you just send around a few tardigrades and a few other things. If they come fine, you know, can we just stop being that they can travel? They definitely can travel. But do you see any danger in that? Do you consider that a contamination or is that justified? No, I think it's, an, it's another cultural issue. You tell someone in India life is a contamination. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's, what's wrong with you? Life is a phenomenon. You know, and, and you can't just go and say it's, it's, the, it's the worst way of, you know, looking at life, which, which in our terms is supposed to be godly in nature, if you like. And just to settle the question of God, yes, you know, scientific method cannot test God, therefore God does not exist. There's no problem with that, and that's, that's how exactly what makes us great in India. You know, we will do the thing as the science thing together simultaneously, very well knowing the two don't agree. I think the idea of God can exist as in harmony with the idea of there being life on other planets or in outer space because the concept of God, at least from my very basic understanding of Hinduism, is not a set person or a set entity, right? Like our Absolutely. ultimate God is energy, right? That's from that's what Absolutely. I it's interpret. It's the ultimate it reality, as. the truth. Yes. I interpret it as Brahma as whatever caused the Big Bang. I see <laughs> Shiva as entropy. I see Vishnu as exthalpy, whatever the opposite of entropy is. Right. So it's not about the idols and the names of whatever 30,000 gods that we have. It's the idea of it, which is a force or a power that is greater than all of us. And so, yes, in Desi culture, these two ideas can exist together, alien life and... Absolutely. Uh, and there is no contradiction. In fact, there were some experiments done in the in early 2000s in India, driven by a couple of scientific organizations to test for, to look for life which might be coming from outside today. Because there is a, a version of panspermia is cometary panspermia. Hmm. The suggestion is that when the solar system was forming, life was introduced into the solar system about 4.5 uh, 5 billion years ago. Right? So when we were forming, everything sort of came you know, uh, from that. A lot of these things were, let's say, lodged into the, the comets. Mm. And then the comets struck the, the young Earth, and that's how life was delivered. So that's the hypothesis. It's a scientifically viable hypothesis because it's falsifiable. So you can do an experiment and test it this way or that way. So it's as good as science it can be. Now, those comets exist even today. Now, those comets from the reservoir of the Oud cloud, they come to the solar system 
even today. Hmm. So and if they gas out and go close to the close to the sun, and if they happen across our orbit, they would literally be dumping some of their stuff onto Earth. Right. Now there were these samples collected at around 20 to 40 odd kilometers, uh, you know, in the atmosphere, and then they found some interesting, uh, let's say, uh, results. Hmm. So that was wonderful experiment done. But the way I looked at it was that height was not enough. I believe panspermia works, but as it happened back then, you know, I had sort of criticized the entire results. <laughs> I was like, the the microbes are not showing any uh, characteristics which are expected to be seen in microbes which are living in a cometary niche, and that's millions of years. Now, now we plan to address this issue once and for all by we have conceptualized a, a spacecraft called as Bijayan. Bijayan. What does that mean? Uh, Bijayan is the, the 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 journey of the sea and is the name of the spacecraft. We announced it in 2019 and we are hoping to get hit a free ride maybe around 2025. So we'll be putting out a research note about it possibly in a week or two. So it's going to be one of the parts we'll be asking for public funding because the idea is to create a spacecraft, you know, which goes to 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 what is considered outer space. Because the, the problem with this 20-40 kilometer experiment was that you are still within, let's say, uh, certain influences of, of the climate. Yes. Although it was very unlikely, but the fact is, you know, that's not good science then. You know, but then if you start collecting samples literally in space, and then you bring them back. So we have planned a sample retrieval mission. We have a very unique take on how to go about it. And as you might expect, because we are doing it from India, it's going to cost pretty less compared to from anywhere else. Even when I read about the Chandrayaan mission and how cheap it was, I was like, yes, Desi people know how to save money. It's inbuilt <laughs> in our culture. No paltu spending. <laughs> so, you know, we have been working on it since 2019. So we had announced it. Uh, and uh, let, let's see. I, I think it's going to be fantastic. Wow, that's pretty big, Pushkar. I mean, you just mentioned it so casually, but that is huge. So you plan to build a spacecraft and launch it into outer space to collect samples to have them tested for signs of life so is there any particular comet or asteroid that you're targeting do you have any can you reveal that now <laughs> I, think they, I think someone will take it up and so that part is taken care of you see no fall to culture you know? <laughs> so you can just hit your ride and apart from that because you know we want to collect samples from a cometary gassing out we, we cannot exactly determine that right now. Okay. We know what are the sort of comets coming, you know, and meteor showers and those sort of things we know. Now, depending upon the the launch window, you know, we'll, we'll figure out that at, at what point in time we'll have the, you know, the greatest collection of, you know, cosmic dust, right. space dust or cometary dust, whatever you want to call it. And then we fall through that. I'm so excited about this. And I hope the listeners also find this exciting, like, this kind of research really, it helps us form the questions with more information, right? The questions about life and the origin. And we may not find the answers, but we may find out the right questions to ask after doing studies like this. The idea of panspermia was even mentioned as early as 5th century BCE by a Greek philosopher called Anaxagoras, who talked about panspermia in his writings. You have written about the Tunguska incident. Is that how you say it, Tunguska? Tunguska? I, I guess so, yes. You want to share a little bit about that? Do you think the Tunguska, was it a meteor, meteorite that crashed? And do you think it had some kind of panspermia cargo? So something comes from space. You know, it sort of hits the atmosphere, if you like. It sort of comes down a bit, spreads a few things, the, releases blast energy, and it actually goes back as well. It goes back? Yes, and, and that is the, the whole paper which I was writing about. And, and when it goes back, you know, there's a suggestion that we know which was the body which went back. Now, Whoa. if we know which was that body, you know, then maybe, you know, we can actually get hold of it again. Because if we have identified it, then why not? So do you mean to say it bounced off of the Earth's atmosphere or bounced off of the surface of Earth? Uh, that, that is absolutely correct. It, it bounced off the surface of Earth, yes. It came around, it, it released this blast energy, and then it, it just sort of bounced off. Wow, that's crazy. And because there was a hypothesis back in you know, 2010 around, uh, we have possibly uh, you know, identified 
what that body might be. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was called as NEA something something. It was an identification number, uh, something to that. Yeah. And that is when, you know, I suggested that, you know, we can actually go and, and send a mission to that particular body. Yeah. Uh, NE, of course, stands for Near Earth Asteroid, and there was some number, you know, behind it. Right. But the, the general term used is called as the Tunguska Space Body. Okay, mm. so that's a, a formal uh, term. And now there's an identification to that, that maybe this particular body was actually that Tunguska Space Body. Now, the thing is that if that is the case, somewhere around 2045, it is going to cross the orbit of Earth. Now, we can send a mission to that body, land on it, like the Stardust mission did from uh, for, for NASA and we can retrieve some samples from there. Now if true what it will tell us is that not only panspermia is possible you know you can also scoop out some part of atmosphere from other planets including life on it because there's a lot of life on earth. Maybe it also picked up some something from somewhere else it's like a mosquito flying in space. Yeah. So we don't know. Did it take something from Earth? Did it survive? Is it still viable? Can it seed life somewhere else? Yes. How interesting. And, and that's how you do good science. The point is only only that, you know, that uh, instead of arguing whether things can travel or not, yeah. you know, we test it. As I was reading up on panspermia, I came across something called extremophiles. Now, right. extremophiles are microbes that can survive under intense unbelievable conditions of heat, light, radiation, pressure, etc. And I discovered new words that I will be using in the future, like osmophiles, which are organisms that thrive in extreme sugar. <laughs> I know some osmo osmophiles. Um, speaking of extremophiles, the more I read about them, the more they just seem indestructible and wired to thrive no matter what the universe throws at them. So are these microorganisms going to be the first ones to time travel, to jump through warp drives and wormholes and come out from under a black hole, live to tell the tale? Do you think these are the organisms that will do all of those things that we can't imagine humans doing? Right. So, I mean, we love extremophiles, you know, because when it comes from the perspective of panspermia, you know, the primary argument that, you know, if you take life and you put it up in, a, in an asteroid and even if you let it shield it a bit, you know, that it won't last. Hmm. Now, extremophiles come along and they say, you know, well, as I say, hold my beer and they go around and do whatever they want to do. They don't die. Yes. No matter what you do, they just survive. I think some of the students put them up in a, in a spacecraft. You know, they go up and they come down. I think by the time they, they come back, you know, they are actually more. So they had some fun on the trip. Wow increasingly there is evidence you know that panspermia is getting more and more support and and that is a good thing about science actually you know because there is so much of scrutiny and see so you, you see the respect for science comes from that because there is constant scrutiny hmm. whether you are einstein or one doesn't matter you know no one is no one is fed you know but then it must go through this process and then come out the winner to me, the more and more I read about it, I don't think we're going to last that long as a species. The way that we've been carrying on, destroying the only planet that we live on, I, I don't see us making it another thousand years. But these extremophiles will be here long past, long past we are gone. So, yeah, they may be the apex, the apex being on our planet after all. Oh, may well be, yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, UFOs and UAPs. What do you think they are? I know there are so many different theories. Like, are they extraterrestrial, which means alien off Earth craft? Are they probes by extraterrestrial? Do you think they are future humans traveling back in time? Do you think they are AI sent by extraterrestrials? Are they multidimensional beings? What do you think? What is your personal pet theory? Uh, let's say from a from a logical perspective, you and I do not make spacecraft in our spare time, yeah. right? So if there is a spacecraft, it means it is built by a state. We require a nation, you know, a country to build it. Yeah. Now there are not too many countries which can build aeroplanes for that matter, leave alone a spacecraft, right? So uh, you know the usual suspects, you know, that maybe these countries built it. Yeah. Now these 
countries, you know, which are good at building these things, they're also very paranoid about going to war with each other and stuff like that. You know, so to believe that there have been these things appearing in the skies of these very countries, you know, and they have no idea of what it is, it, it makes little sense to begin with. Nonetheless, you know, if there's something put up in the sky and, and general normal citizens cannot put it up, you require a, a, a country or a, or a nation state to put it, it can only mean two things that either this is military or this is extraterrestrial. Hmm. There's nothing in between. So, well, so now the phenomenon is real. The UFO phenomenon is real. What do you think those crafts are? Let's say, yes, they are otherworldly. What do you think they, they represent? What do you think? Now, once again, if you go back to the scientific method, you, know, you want to, you, you have an observation. On research, you make a prediction, and you let you have, I can have an opposite prediction. You suggest that they are outward, they are, they, maybe they are from here. Both are equally good line of inquiry. <laughs> so, here the issue now is that we require samples, we require something to do good science with. Well, yes, there's a UFO up there, so what do I do? <laughs> because they literally, science can do nothing about it because you don't have the data nor the samples. Whatever said is nothing but speculation. Yes. So do you believe they are manned crafts? Do you think they're actually like aliens sitting in there looking at us and flying those things? If you believe uh, that life exists in different planets, and if you also believe that way of evolution of life right. is universal, it's not going to be as alien as you know, we think they are going to be. Right. From perspective, we know they cannot be necessarily too different from being carbon-based. You know, but thereafter, the thing is that if these two things are true, then we can actually guess their motivations to an extent. Mm -hmm. Now we are going into an entirely different territory. Motivations for what? The prevailing fear seen in Western media is that if there is life in outer space and if ETs are visiting us, it is to invade us. And that seems to be the prevailing Idea. No, absolutely, and, and the, other ridiculous, the most ridiculous thing, uh, they would like to ask whoever they are, it doesn't matter, Pentagon and all that, what sort of national security threat, my friend, is really at their mercy, my friend, you know, so kindly come out of that trance, and this is a global phenomenon, if anything, it's a global security issue, and I'm, I have as, as much as a say in it, as do you. And that's the, the context which must be set. It is not about the United States of America or about Europe or something like that. It is a global phenomenon and we are joining the conversation. We are a little late because we are now. Yes, exactly. There is no threat because uh, we are not equals when it comes to uh, our alien visitors. We are not on the same plane as them. If they have managed to master interstellar travel, you know, maybe they're even traveling through wormholes or whatever it is. They are very clearly more advanced than us. Their intentions may be unknowable to us, but they may have gone through this life cycle that we are currently in the middle of. They have seen it all. They have seen civilizations rise and fall. Maybe they have, and they know that violence is not the answer. Something I wish humans would understand. And, you know, they don't come to us in hostility. Maybe that's... You know, they just come to visit us and they're like, have these people evolved beyond their violent designs? Nope. Okay. Goodbye. See ya. <laughs> See you in another hundred years. And so they keep coming back to check on us and we just keep getting worse. Now, this is a problem in the year for phenomena investigations is because by calling it a UAP is nothing but trying to get some guilt out of your way. Because, you know, you made such a mockery of UFOs mm -hmm. that, you know, now you want to call it an unidentified aerial phenomenon going to look at the, um, the things which show up in the air but I'm not going to even touch at any alien abductions or cattle mutilation because that is just too much. That is not good yeah, I think that UAP rebranding was a very concerted effort by, by the US military complex to distance themselves from the UFO community because of the ridicule that they themselves had installed in, in the field. It's their own guilt, yes. And they're like, we made this sound like uh, the stuff of nut jobs, and now we want to publicly participate. But you know, we're too ashamed, so we're just gonna change the name, just rebrand it, rebrand it. It's UAPs. 
Okay, so uh, here's my next question. And again, I know we may not have, you know, scientific conclusions or definite answers, but what do you think? You, do you think ETs or aliens are more likely to be humanoid? What does science say? When you say post-biological evolution, do you mean AI? Do you mean cyborgs? What do you mean? You're oh, already okay. post-biological. You mean like enhanced like uh, humans uh, 2.0 right. when we figure out how to enhance our own biological uh, yes and vessels. you can have certain smart materials let's say down the line of so the so-called uh, you know out of these nanobots if you like you know so if you are being born and if your eyes are not going to be in place you simply you know you're designed in in that way and that is not too far in the future, actually right. you know so post biological evolution you know i mean you, why the hell do you need a kneecap for replacement surgery you know you can have the nanobots take care of it up, up Front, yeah, you know, so so stuff like that. Now, if we are not talking that, you right. know, because that will really depend upon how the technological evolution goes, and if if the if the if the march of the civilization is going to be towards technology or where we really don't know, you know, because back here when we you know I have asked certain spiritual masters about artificial intelligence, they don't seem to care at all, <laughs> as if it's not a big deal, and a lot of discourse about open AI by Elon Musk and stuff like that. You know, and this thing, but they don't seem to give a damn. Make is that if evolution is going to be universal, then we can more or less be sure that they are, cannot be too different from us. They cannot be too alien. So all those weird, goopy-looking creatures with like ten heads and tentacles instead of legs and feet, you know, like we see in Men in Black or Star Wars and stuff. Those are basically it's just imaginative, right? That's yeah, not... maybe they are their mercenaries version of something, yeah. you know, <laughs> go and destroy the planet. <laughs> Maybe those are bioweapons that... Oh, yeah, uh, very well they might be, yes. Yeah, that ETs create. So, okay. And then I know we talked a little bit about this earlier, but what do you envision an ET invasion to look like? Now, invasion doesn't have to be hostile, right? It could right. simply be um, how an alien life integrates, assimilates, maybe even dominates us. How do you think that would look? Do you think it's going to be the X-Files version where the aliens spread through microorganisms and it's more viral in nature? Or do you think it's more like Independence Day where you have big ships come over and blast everyone? Yeah, I think that's always more exciting for you. <laughs> And, you know, and, and, and something, you know, that will be fun you know, in, in, in a very dark way. <laughs> but then, you know, let's say if all the UFO sightings, you know, and if we put a story together, you know, so they are coming around the Roswell, you know, so what we know is they are, you know, in spite of not having much traffic, you know, they are not very good pilots. They tend to crash here and there. So yeah. That is one thing we know about them. <laughs> Other thing is that they have been doing this acrobatics way before we had any supersonic planes or stuff like that or hypersonic stuff, you know, so they have been doing it for, for donkey years. Another thing we know is that, well, they are in a position to abduct anyone, anytime, anywhere. They have a particular fascination for cattle mutilation, it looks like. So we know a few things, you know, some patterns are already being, are already established. They generally do not harm us. Mm. You know, and even if they pick us up, you know, they do a few things and they send us back and we generally die the normal way. So if they wanted to exterminate us, you know, we, that could have been done long ago. So the very fact that you're not exterminating something, you know, maybe it doesn't mean anything to you or maybe it means something to you. And I would believe that the, if you bring in the Drake equation and stuff like that, what we do know for sure is that intelligent life is not common. So maybe we do mean something for sure, you know, and maybe that's why we are not being exterminated. You know, so there is a pattern which we can read into into the into the behaviors of all these sort of sightings say that let a certain thing have been captured by the by the governments and they have been being studied it doesn't change the fact that more of these ufos are any which way is coming i mean you can have your own stockpile i think bob lazar said he had some seen some i think just under a dozen different ufos at area 51 but that has not stopped sending them in the in the, in the new millennium they are still coming yeah you know yeah. all of this indicates to us that number one that if they're already here they're not going to kill us for sure hmm. You know, so the invasion, you know, is most likely if, if, if we want to use that term, because it's a very negative term, if you like. Yes, invasion. Like, that's why I mentioned maybe it's not an invasion. Right. Maybe it's an assimilation. Um you know, sometimes you get this question, you know, that why do we get so many UFO sightings in the United States, you know, and, and not so many 
the Indian subcontinent, you know, and generally um, there's a scientific answer to way of looking at it. You know, it's like asking that why do you get so many tigers and lions, you know, in India? So there can be reason or motivation which we don't understand. Mm. Another one can be, you know, which is the country which is most likely to do some uh, going to invasions and wars. You know, maybe that's why they are there, trying to tell them, you know, <laughs> don't, don't, do, don't do all this. Don't go to war. You know, India is not going to war anyway. I believe there's a really good documentary on this called UFOs and Nukes. And right. uh, apparently there are more sightings around nuclear bases and missile silos all over the world. Yes, I heard about that, yes. So, yes, it sounds like they're clearly... Studying us, keeping an eye on us, making sure we don't... No, letting us live and do our stuff and fight the pandemic. And they don't seem to care about that either. <laughs> so, uh, Again, it's a conspiracy theory that COVID is an alien virus that is taking because it's taking over the whole world so it's some kind of alien virus to call the population um, yeah i i honestly don't call them conspiracy theories you know because what what happens then is that once that thing sets up you know i don't take it seriously yeah. and and when, when a subject is so open and wide it is important required of me to take everything seriously at the very least yeah. that's what i can do right so in fact in um, october 2020 there was this meteorite i think strike in china mm. there is a hypothesis already in place by professor vikrama singh suggesting that uh, covid-19 is actually a product of panspermia wow. sars cov 2 came from outside they had made a similar, yeah, it's a similar claim that was made in early 2000 when the original SARS, uh, you know, pandemic had happened, mm. that SARS virus fell from space. I would believe it because think about it. Um, all the dinosaurs on planet Earth would have been the supreme animal if they hadn't just died out mysteriously. We still don't know why they've all died out. They say, yes, there was some kind of meteorite that hit the earth and extinguished them but throughout the whole planet how did they die off it could be because of some panspermia some microorganism that got introduced in the environment that you know killed them off I believe that it's, it's uh, the whole thing is cosmic in nature and you know as, as Mulder would say you know that that uh, he wanted to find out the truth but the the tools had been taken away <laughs> you know, and maybe that's what's happening, you know, by keeping everything behind, you know, redacting data, not giving you access to, uh, you know, data to observation. What you do, you take away the tools of investigation. So you mentioned a research paper by Dr. Vikram Singhe. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about that if listeners wanted to go and read up on that theory? But it was especially Professor Nardlikar who went ahead and that was in 2003 that he suggested that, uh, well, SARS virus fell from, fell from the sky around the Himalayas. And the idea was based in, in the book, which was actually, you know, the scientist who should have won a Nobel Prize and did not. That is Sir uh, Fred Hoyle. And Singhe, Sonar Likar, they are all uh, students of Hoyle, mm. right? And they have written this book called uh, Diseases from Space. They, in the sense, Fred Hoyle and Vikram Singhe. Right, and the idea was that the the uh, at this 1908 uh, pandemic was actually you know it spread so quickly that the only way that spread was possible so quickly was only through panspermia. Yes, and that's why it was so devastating because if we have existed for millions of years, mutations of this order can't just occur overnight like this, right? Like you, right. we would so have had is... an idea about. Uh, a virus turning so deadly we would have seen it coming but if it was so sudden if it was overnight and if it was so unknown to us that we were still struggling to make vaccines for it that kind of begs the question did it even belong in this world perhaps not that's why these are brilliant men you know Narlikar, uh, Hoyle, Vikram Singh these are brilliant men you know they might not have ideas which are necessarily I mean for example Professor Narlikar does not believe in the Big Bang does that hmm. make him a nut job <laughs> That is not how science is done. You know, he's as good as a scientist as they come. Mm -hmm. And similarly, Professor Vikrama Singh, you know, working along with Fred Hoyle, they, they made some bold, bold claims. They backed it up with some fantastic research. Now, down the line, yes, you know, because there has been so much of, uh, let's say, this all becoming rather, rather murky <laughs> overall in terms of research. But then it is very much an hypothesis which must be looked into, you know, that this virus, whether it is, let's say, man-made, whether it whether it is from outer space, these are all 
parts of inquiry. Mm. And, yes. and, and, and going to these men who, who decided to take certain, you know, stances which are not necessarily popular, you know, but that's how science is done. Yeah. I totally forgot to mention it earlier, but do you want to talk about the Fermi paradox? I'll just kick it off real quick. So the Fermi paradox is the conflict between the lack of clear, obvious evidence of extraterrestrial life and various high estimates for their existence, which means, so an Italian-American physicist, Enrico Fermi, uh, came up with this uh, Fermi's paradox. Basically, they had a casual conversation in the summer of 1950 with fellow physicists. And during lunch, Fermi blurted out, but where is everyone? So the probability of having life in outer space is very high, but there is no clear evidence that they exist. So the Milky Way, is 13 billion years old. Our planet is just about 4 billion years old. So that gives plenty of time for other advanced civilizations to have existed and ended and maybe recreated themselves, right? So where are they? Just because you can figure out, you know, you can send, uh, you can just stumble to the moon and to Mars, you believe you can know the answers. Too much of hubris, I believe. So it follows by, well, you know, if they existed, we should have found out by now. Like, that is the most ridiculous thing to say. Like, like I, I mean, like, really? How long have you been searching? You know, it doesn't make any sense. Let's, let's look at the question. Where is everybody? All right. So we are recording a podcast today. Right? And you expected me to be around at a certain time. If I do not show up, is that you expected to me to be there? And I was not. That's why you asked the question, where is Peter? Why the hell is he asking where is everybody in the first place? That Fermi paradox is already inclination towards where is everybody? They expected to find it. Not that they did not expect to find it. Hence the question and hence the paradox. And I believe, my, my personal belief is that, you know, let's say if you, you know, one of the solutions of Fermi paradox is they're already here. And we are acting as if that is not a valid solution. Yeah, we didn't make any appointments with them. So I don't know why we expected them to show up. <laughs> also, um, I believe the James Webb Telescope, which is one of the most powerful tools in astronomy. And I believe we will be able to see further into the universe, further than we have ever seen before. And maybe we'll finally see something. Maybe we'll finally see some signs Maybe we'll finally be able to see the face on Mars and all those other anomalies that you see online from the rover, uh, Curiosity rover, um, the, its uh, transmissions. You know, people try to find uh, evidence of, man, you know, well, not man-made, but sentient, intelligent structures that were constructed on Mars millions of years ago and trying to prove there is life on Mars. What happens is that if I want to say something, uh, what is considered to be nut jobby thing, you know, but if I want to put it in a very scientific way, then there's a term for that. It's called as a prior technological, uh, prior technological species. Yeah. So do you want to tell us a little bit about what IARF, uh, your research institute, has plans for in the near future and, you know, the, for, uh, the coming year, say 2022? What are your plans? What's exciting? What's coming up? This is an unidentified social phenomenon. It, the UFOs, the aliens are already amongst the people. And therefore, what people say, think, it matters. And governments cannot decide the agendas. It also means that we require the people on Reddit and stuff, you know, to contribute to the science directly. Because as long as you are in the scientific method, we are all the same. Now, to take taking all these thoughts together, you know, we have decided to go public with raising funds to build India's first astrobiology institute, including a center of excellence for UFOs. And uh, the new year, we, we begin that announcement to raise the funds to build it in Mumbai, in India. Excellent. And I hope all the listeners here are excited by that news and you are able to contribute to this great endeavor um, to try and make our world a little, you know, closer, make us a little more intelligent, a little more informed and not at the mercy of secretive government and military industrial complexes, right? Let's take back the control in a scientific way. It doesn't have to be speculative. It has to be something that is tangible, that is 
studyable, researchable. And thank you so much, Pushkar, for contributing to that endeavor. And I'm very happy that this is coming from, you know, from India. I'm so happy. No, that makes so a lot proud. of sense. And uh, I mean, as an organization, we have been around since 20, I mean, 2006. So it's, it's, we, are, we, are, we are around for, we are around for some time, 15 odd years, you know, but then, uh, you know, so space has picked up big time in the Indian subcontinent. And at the same time, I mean, we did not make the make the Pentagon release. You know, we find ourselves in a position to make some serious contributions which will help the subject. And therefore, the decision to go public and to raise funds and to build the institute. So we want to, I mean, you know, in a very broad way, we would like to emulate the SETI Institute in Arizona, you know, but, but add our Desi flavor to it. Yeah, I think as Desi's, um, we are kind of conditioned to be humble, to be modest, to be quiet, to do our work and let the work speak for itself and kind of wait to be discovered. That really doesn't work for us when it comes to the global front. I've discovered that when I moved to the U.S. Over here, it's very different. So here, you have to scream it from the rooftops about how good you are and what potential you have. And you have to be vocal about your accomplishments and your capabilities. In India, we say, Hire ki, what is it called? Hire ki pehchan, johari ko hoti hai. <laughs> yes, a jeweler is the one who can appreciate the value of a diamond. But over here, the diamond has to scream out from the, you know, rooftops and declare itself worthy of being inspected and scrutinized. Actually, and so, the strategy is rather simple. We will continue to be uh, humble. However, the shouting is required. And yes. then we'll pick up from the scriptures, and there is a there's a in there's a saying which goes like uh, yoga kshem vaham meham. So I will do my science, the God will do the shouting. And it's pretty difficult to yes. beat God yes. at anything, yes. you see. <laughs> so uh, we had an amazing, wonderful conversation, Pushkar. Thank you for spending your precious time on you know. It, and, and you should do it for India, you know, I think I think it will be great, you know, I mean, we'll be glad to host you, support you, you know, because we, we don't have any podcast, you know, we speak about what happens in India. So maybe you should consider something on that nature. Absolutely. That's my whole goal. Bring South Asian. Well, this would be part of my strange phenomenon uh, section. But you know what? Strange phenomenon is great. It's something to pique curiosity and, you know, have people look into things they probably never heard of before or haven't cared about before. And that's the whole goal. So thank you so much, Pushkar. Um, I'm going to end the episode with one question. Have you had a sighting of your own? Uh, no. <laughs> Do you wish to have a sighting on your own? What would be your ideal contact with ETs? What would that look like? Uh, just tell me, I mean, do you have, do you know why we exist or do I need to find more aliens for that now? No, let's just assume they exist. Let's assume that ETs exist. I, I, I want to ask, I like, I'll meet the alien, you know, I'll, I'll of course take a bit of a ride in the UFOs. And after <laughs> that, you know, I'll just put my arm around the alien and I'll be like, do you know why we exist? <laughs> <laughs> so if the alien knows, I'm happy. If the alien does not know, I'll be like, do you know any other alien races which exist? <laughs> Oh, that's the ah. that's the idea and thank you so much for having me on the podcast Pia lovely thanks so much Pushkar yes thank you that's all we had for this episode of Crimes from the East your they see true crime and strange phenomenon podcast with a little masala and 